All right. Thank you, everybody, for being here. I will continue to add people as they come in, but welcome to those of you who are here. We'll begin right away. My name is Deanna Peck, and I am the Director of Peer Connections, Tutoring, Mentoring, Supplemental Instruction, and Learning Assistance on campus. Um, we are very privileged here today to have three special guests, and I will let them introduce themselves pretty soon. And today's format is just, it's basically a question and answer. We have some pre-prepared questions that we'll ask all the panelists. And then at the end, we'll have a chance for all of you to go ahead and ask questions yourselves. The chat is functional, so if you want, you can always put in a question in the chat room. Okay. And with that, let one more person into the room. And then we're going to go ahead and begin. So today we are talking about choosing the right graduate program. How do you know which school you want to go to? What kinds of questions and decisions are you going to have to make? And the first person I would like to introduce is Dr. AJ Foss. Um, if you could say your name, current role at San Jose State, the degrees you received, and what schools you attended so that all of the students listening get to know a little bit about you. Sure. Hi, my name is AJ Foss. I'm an associate professor of anthropology, and I'm also the uh, coordinator of the graduate program uh, in anthropology here at San Jose State University. We have a master's degree in applied anthropology. Um, I, Recording, you may hang up. I have um, completed a few degrees on my way here. I have an undergraduate degree in anthropology from Montclair State University in New Jersey. I have a, a master's degree in applied anthropology also from Montclair State University in New Jersey. I am three credits shy of a professional certificate in geomatics from Rutgers University in New Jersey. It's been 20 years, so it's doubtful I'll finish that at this point. Um, and and uh, I have a PhD in cultural anthropology from the University of South Florida. Great, thank you. You do have quite a few there. <laughs> All right, the next panelist that we have is Dr. Elizabeth Mullen. Again, name, role, degrees received, and schools attended. Hi, everyone. I am Elizabeth Mullen. I am an associate professor of management in the College of Business at SDSU. I have a PhD from the University of Illinois at Chicago in social psychology. There are a handful of social psychologists working in business schools. Uh, along the way, I picked up a master's degree, also from the University of Illinois at Chicago, and my undergraduate degree is in, in psychology from the University of Memphis. Uh, prior to working at San Jose State, I mean, I work with MBA students here at San Jose State. Um, prior to working at San Jose State, I was at Stanford and uh, George Washington University, where I supervised PhD students. So I know what it's like to be the PhD student, PhD student, but also um, and to work with some PhD students. So I'm happy to answer questions about that. Great, thank you so much. And our third panelist is Dr. Rebecca Bursiaga. Hi, good, good afternoon. Um, Rebecca Bursiaga. I am an associate professor of educational leadership and the interim chair of the department. I also have a joint appointment in Chicana and Chicano studies. Uh, I did my undergraduate work at UC Santa Cruz, go slugs, uh, and then I did a master's degree uh, in administration planning and social policy at the Harvard Graduate School of Education. And then I did my PhD at UCLA uh, with, a, with a social science and comparative education, but a concentration in race, race and ethnic studies. Wonderful. Thank you very much. And we will get moving then. Initially, I thought I'd have all of the participants introduce themselves, but since we do have 20 some people on here as participants, I'm going to skip over this so that you actually have more time for questions at the end. So 
first question that this might be a review for those of you who were here last week, but many of you might say, what are the different degrees that one can get? What does it mean to go to graduate school? What are the degrees? So I just wanted to quickly put this slide up and talk about them. You have three different types of graduate schools. You have your master's programs, which are often the MA, the MS, the MBA, MFAs. Um, these are specialized degrees that really look at specific disciplines. They often take about two years, depending on where you go and if you're going full time or not, but typically it says about two years to complete. And it leads to careers in the industry, typically. Um, oftentimes financial aid is available because you can use it as part of your financial aid package throughout that. Uh, we did talk about the difference between going on for a master's degree and a graduate degree versus just having your bachelor's degree. And one of the things they pointed out is really you have a lot more autonomy once you get that master's degree. Then there's the professional doctorate, which that oftentimes takes three to four years to complete. And this is a terminal degree for professional fields. So being a lawyer, being a doctor, something like that, that would have a terminal degree, but it's not the PhD, which we'll talk about a little bit. The financial aid varies. Sometimes you can pay or get paid to take that, but oftentimes students getting the professional doctorates will end up paying their own way. And again, it has dentists is another one that has the professional doctorate. And then the third is the research doctorates, which are the PhDs, the doctors of philosophy. This is a terminal degree. This is oftentimes who you will see as your professors in colleges and universities. Oftentimes it takes more than four years once you begin graduate school to finish that. And this can lead to a career in the industry or a, as well as being at the university, like I said, teaching the classes that you're taking. So those are the different types of degrees. Um, panelists, would you want to add anything to what I just mentioned before we move on? No, that was a great good overview. I might, uh, I might like to add just uh, the one thing I would like to add is that um, I think those of us in higher ed often say industry uh, and we mean something by that. And, and students oftentimes don't quite grasp what we mean by that. So uh, by industry, we mean these types of degrees are going to prepare you for work outside of academic institutions, but not necessarily in business and industry. Uh, this can be, these different degrees can prepare you for work in multiple sectors and and that can be in uh, government at the city, county, state, or federal level. Uh, this can be with uh, businesses and industry, think Silicon Valley, think um, you know, wherever you want to set your sights on, um, and also in the nonprofit uh, organization sector. So when we're saying industry, we mean those things um, in a broad sense. And, and when, when it's said here at San Jose State, it means not at university like the rest of us here. Thank you very much. That was a great clarification. If at any time any of the participants, students watching um, would like to ask a question, feel free, like I said, put it in the chat. I'll be watching the chat room. You can also raise your hand and I'll be watching that as well. All right. So panelists, how did you decide what you wanted to do? I've had many undergraduate students say, I think I want to go on to grad through school, but I just don't know what field or how do I make that decision. How did you all come to that decision? I can start. Uh, so I was in a similar situation I, as an undergraduate. Uh, I'm not quite sure what I wanted to do um, my junior year. Uh, and one of the things that really helped was to meet with a professor. Uh, that I was taking a class with, I was really interested in the content. Uh, and at the time she had funding um, to, for a research project. Um, not all faculty have funding for research projects, but in general, I share this to say that oftentimes keys to what you're interested in lie in perhaps some of the classes that you're currently taking 
taking or classes that you've taken in the past. And it's always a good idea to start um, by meeting with a professor um, and have them help you uh, point in different directions. So after I graduated, then I ended up working um, as an outreach counselor. Uh, so I worked um, before I went for my master's degree and decided that, um, you know, I, I needed more schooling, more education. Um, so that's when I went off. But I think part of it is just tapping into what you currently love and finding a way to apply it to see if, um, if graduate school is the right choice. I can follow up on that. I, um, like Rebecca, also got interested based on um, some classes I was taking and, saw, and a particular professor um, that was nice enough to sort of mentor me through that. But I got, I was an undergraduate degree in psychology and um, I got involved in research projects with a faculty member at the university where I worked uh, to learn more about the research. I got excited about the research process. And so uh, in conversations with that faculty member, I started to get advice on graduate programs and how I could continue to pursue uh, a research career. So I'll just echo everything Rebecca said. Yeah, start with um, talking to your current professors uh, let them know what you're interested in and they might um, have a you know better sense of programs, et cetera, that, that would serve those uh, interests well. But for me, I got involved in the research and that was also very helpful when applying to graduate school. It sort of strengthened my application because I had experience um, doing what I would be doing when I was in graduate school. Uh, mine was unpaid. Uh, just like Rebecca said, not everybody has uh, funding to do that. So um, I also recognize not everybody has the time to volunteer, um, but if you can, um, that's also another way to go and to learn more about it. You'll make sure you know that you enjoy what you're doing right before you sign up for another couple of extra years of, of schooling in that area. I'll turn it over to AJ. Thank you. Yes, my, my experience um, is, is very, very similar to Drs. Mullen and Bursiaga. Um, uh, what I'll add to this this is um, that, you know, I, I didn't make one decision about what I wanted to do. I made a dozen or more over the course of 10 years, at least. Um, and so, you know, I began, I mentioned that I have an undergraduate degree and a master's degree and a PhD in anthropology. So that, that, that can give the mistaken impression that like this was just a straight line, uh, a, prog a progression for me. And it, and it most certainly was not. Um, I became interested in, I went to undergrad you know, I was 22 years old when I started undergraduate um, and was a first generation, very confused college student uh, and was very, very interested in um, uh, traditional music of small cultures in West Africa and the Caribbean. And that's what I wanted to do the anthropology of. And uh, thankfully, I was really receptive to the training and mentorship of my professors there who sort of steered me um, uh, to more uh, viable and helpful pursuits um, and then got me involved in research. And I'll never forget the day I walked into my junior year. I walked into my professor's uh, office and I said, you know, I'm really good at reading anthropology books and writing anthropology papers, but I need to find out if I'm any good at doing anthropology. And he turned around with a pen in his mouth like a, like a cartoon sort of Groucho Marx. And he said, you go down the stairs. And he sent me to another professor downstairs who got me doing really interesting research that turned into my master's thesis work um, in which was really more urban anthropology and poverty issues. Um, and then by the time I was in my uh, PhD program a few years later, um, I was interested in similar issues, but in Latin America, I lived in Mexico at the time. Uh, and when I got involved with my professors in my graduate program, they were working around really critical environmental issues and disaster issues in Ecuador and South America. And this really helped reframe my whole approach. So I want to say that I made a lot of decisions. Um, now I am in environmental and disaster anthropology and in Latin America. Um, I made a lot of decisions that contributed to where I was going, but no one of them actually determined where I was going. Um, it was always made in conversation and in community with my professors and faculty. Great, thank you. I think that's a great point that I do want to stress out too, is that 
every journey is a little bit different to going to graduate school and getting that final degree. And I've been talking to a number of people and I just say, you can ask 10 people about their experiences and what they recommend, and you're probably gonna get 10 different answers. Um, so I like to put that out there because sometimes people think, oh, th there's only one way to do it. And if I don't do it this way, then it's all messed up. And then, you know, all that kind of stuff. Um, but all three of you mentioned something and it's not on my slide. So I'm gonna ask the question now. You all mentioned that you have research experience as an undergrad. Is that necessary? What if I'm a senior now and I haven't necessarily done that research experience? Can I still go on to grad school? Yes, absolutely. I think uh, it depends on what you're interested in studying. Uh, I, for the field of education, it's pretty common to not have uh, opportunities to do research as an undergraduate. Um, but I think that that's different depending on the fields. Uh, I think that that question would be a good one to ask of a faculty member uh, whose course you liked, for example. Uh, and you can just say, you know, I don't have this kind of experience. What would you recommend that I supplement it with, if, you know, if I needed it? Or what would you recommend? Who do I speak with? Or can you connect me with another graduate student maybe to help me um, find pathways? But more than anything, I'm hoping that you're seeing faculty members as connectors. You know, we don't have all the answers, but I'm, I'm hoping that you're, you're, you'll be using us as resources. I would also say the answer to that question might depend a bit on discipline, right? I mean, we're sort of all in the social sciences here. Um, in psychology or even in PhD programs in organizational behavior and management programs, I think some preference is given to applicants who have research experience. Um, again, because it's such a large commitment of time to graduate school, it's not so much that you have all the skills you need, it's just more that you have an idea of what research is, the time and effort involved in that. And then I think faculty, um, as someone who sat on those admissions committees, faculty have more um, sense of confidence that you're going to succeed in in the program, right? Having already understood what research is and who like it and who want to do it, we're more confident that you'll succeed once you come. I would say it's not a 100% requirement, but e even if you're like, in response to Deanna's question, even if you're a senior and don't have research experience yet, it might not be too late, right? Even a semester of experience uh, gives, you a, gives you a lot. It helps also when you're interviewing, you have projects to talk about. Here are the skills I developed when I was a volunteer or when I was a research assistant in this lab. And so um, again, to, to follow up on what Rebecca said, right, talk to your current professors to see they may be able to connect you with someone else at San Jose State who has a project going on right now that you might be interested in where they also need some help. So I would say any experience is going to be uh, better than none, but this is very specific to my discipline. Um, and so, but that is not too late. Or if you're going to take, I've also had students who finished their undergrad degree, took a year or two off before pursuing a graduate degree. And in that intervening time, in addition to having a job, also uh, was working in someone's lab, like to gain that research experience. So I would just say it's definitely not too late. Um, depending upon your discipline, like it still might be a good idea even to pick up a, a semester. Thank you. I mean, Oh, I don't have too much to add. I mean, I really think that 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 what Dr. Mullen said there um, about you know some experience is always a little bit better than none. Um, but it's it's rarely going, especially if you're coming out of undergraduate. If you want to go into a master's or a professional degree, um, it's it's rarely going to be a barrier to entry for you. Um, and. Uh, but yeah, CK, you know, I, whether you're going into a graduate degree or you're going into a career field, um, you know, the data are out there that you really want to aim for a, a GPA of 3.0 or higher and, and one or two internships if you can. And, and better um, still, if, if one of those internships is research-based um, or research assistantship or apprenticeship with a professor will increase your chances of either landing the right jobs when you're getting out of an graduate degree or positioning yourself for um, 
graduate study. So I would add that to both of them. It's, it's important to build these experiences and these co-curricular experiences, really regardless of your trajectory. Um, I think that there's a question hiding behind this one too, which is like, do I need to know uh, what I'm doing when I go into graduate school? But maybe I'll wait till that one comes. Actually, I'll go ahead and answer that now. I think you're right on target there. Okay. Okay. Um, well, I mean, I think there's a lot of other choices that, that maybe we'll talk, talk about in a minute in terms of, of learning about the faculty and the, the um, alumni of a program. So um, I'm going to try, it's, it's sort of hard to bracket that aside from, from this question, but I, I will say this, that, um, and, and I'm sure my colleagues um, maybe have uh, uh, similar or different experiences. Um, what I know is that, you know, a graduate students, they come, there's all kinds, right? But generally speaking, in my experience, particularly in the first weeks and months of that first semester, they sort into two different types, broadly speaking, right? And it is those who are like laser focused and they think that they know their topic and the thing that they absolutely want to work on. And I'm focused on this one particular thing. And I know what I want to do my research on. Um, and those are usually the more competent students. Um, and then there's the other ones that are like, I think I'd like environmental anthropology. I took a cool class on it and maybe that's what I want, but I don't know yet. And those are the ones who typically um, uh, want for confidence. Uh, they're a little envious of some of their, uh, uh, the folks in that other cohort. Um, and, but let me tell you this, that I think that, and we're gonna get into, again, thinking about faculty and alumni and how you pick a program that's right for you and aligned with your interests. But I generally um, find it a lot easier to work with the students who are in that second group that are like, I'm not really sure I have these broad interests. We can help you and mentor you um, and, and help you work to developing an interest and one that's aligned with things that are already going on in the graduate program where you're gonna have support Will you be able to carve out your own piece of an ongoing group project or something that a faculty principal investigator has going on? The other folks who come in super focused are oftentimes are, are rather resistant to learning or resistant to learning anything that's outside of that laser-like focus, right? Um, and and th those are the students that oftentimes, and this is a bit counterintuitive, but those are the students that oftentimes struggle because they just want to do their one little thing and and they're intolerant of things outside of that um and so i often tell students that you know uh you're not going to leave your graduate program with the same ideas and interests that you came in with and if you do someone has let you down it's either the faculty or your own self who's being resistant to this sort of stuff so um I think that it's important, like I said, we make decisions that contribute to where we're going in our academic careers, um, but they don't by themselves determine it. So you have to be open uh, to learning and feedback and, uh, and growth with your faculty and your peers and your cohort. Thank you. You're right. It did open straight into the next question. So what are the factors I should consider when choosing a graduate school program? I can start us off. Um, I think, again, this is maybe more specific to social sciences. Um, you should look at the quality of the program overall. And you should look at, is there someone there that I particularly am interested in working with? Programs vary in terms of whether they have a mentorship model, like you go to the program for, to work particularly with one faculty member versus you're accepted into the program at large and have an opportunity to work work with and learn from um, multiple faculty members. In both of those cases, there'll be coursework, right, that will help broaden what you know and learn. But in terms of research projects, programs vary a bit in terms of, of whether they have a one-to-one -one mentorship model versus program model. So you should learn about that. But I, I say, you know, find at least one person who's already doing work that you're excited about and interested in learning more about. It's even better if you can find more than one person in the same program, because faculty members uh, don't always stay in the same place forever, right? You don't wanna go to a program to work with one person and then they move and you're now 
in Iowa and, you know, a bit adrift. And so the strengths of the program, uh, if there's multiple people you're interested in working with, and to do this, I would just start, I mean, start talking to current faculty members, but you can also Google and start learning a bit more about the faculty that are at particular places that you're interested in, what kind of research they're doing. Does that research sound interesting to you? Does that seem like something you would want to get involved in? And then you can also uh, talk to recent alumni. Any um, good faculty member should be willing to connect you with recent students of theirs who have left the program and are presumably working elsewhere, either at other universities or in industry, um, and they can give you insight into uh, what the program was like for them as well. And most programs during the admission process will also let you talk to current students, right? And you can interview current graduate students about their experiences. So um, those are my three things. I'm sure uh, other folks have, have uh, other ideas. Great, well, Liz touched on uh, a couple of things that I, I uh, was going to talk about, but I think some things that are, um, that influenced my choosing, uh, my master's program specifically, uh, I was still not sure exactly what I wanted to do in the field of education. Um, I looked at a couple different programs. There was a very specific counseling program and I was like, no, that's not my thing. Uh, but then, you know, on a whim, I just decided to try for Harvard. Um, and part of the appeal was that they have an interdisciplinary uh, program. So similar to um, what Dr. Bellin said it was an opportunity to go and be accepted to a program and then learn from multiple people. So I was able to take courses not just in the School of Ed, um, but in the Kennedy School. Um, I think the Divinity School, I didn't take classes there, but you can choose from other courses. So sometimes there are programs that will allow a flexibility for you to figure it out. Um, it's a one year program. There's not a whole lot of um, opportunity to hunker down and work with faculty. However, um, that is a really, really important thing to keep in the back of your mind because if you decide to then go on for your PhD, you will want to have at least one letter of recommendation from a faculty member in your master's program. So even if you apply to one of those kind of catch-all you know, allow me to explore programs, it's still a, critical if you're going to go on to your PhD um, or EDD um, or JD or <laughs> um, to make sure that you get to know faculty well enough and they get to know you well enough uh, to write you a strong letter of recommendation. Um, yeah. Um, I would like to, uh, yeah, just endorse what, what my colleagues already said. Um, and if I can add anything to that, it's going to be, particularly when it's a master's program or one of those professional doctorates, um, I th think I, I think in all cases, master's program, professional doctorates or research doctorates, you want to research faculty and alumni. So that, that's already been said. Um, but I want to, if you're looking at the professional uh, uh, doctorates and the master's degrees, I want to add a little extra emphasis on the alumni. Um, and uh, in terms of looking up whether it's, you know, directly contacting alumni um, or, or looking for alumni information on the program website. And this is something I'm particularly proud of with my own program where we have rather extensive profiles on all of our alumni and their careers and where they're at today. Um, and I'm proud of it because, um, well, there's not very many good things you can say about university websites in general, let's be honest. Um, and, uh, and, and there aren't enough out there that, um, and program websites that, that feature much about, about alumni. There are exceptions. Um, find out as much as you can about alumni. Think of it like a visioning exercise. Um, look at the types of careers and positions and jobs that people are in and say, you know, is, is that a place I can envision myself and would I be happy there on the other end of a program like this? Um, when we're looking more towards the, the research end of it, um, it's more important to, um, as Dr. Mullen already said, right, to identify faculty um, and not to hang your hat just on one, but to make sure that there's more than one that's working in your area um, so that you can make sure that you're going to have the support and guidance and mentorship 
you need to, to move into that area yourself. And even if it's a broad topical interest, like I said, environmental issues or migration issues or something like that. Thank you. I've, I've heard a lot about the faculty and the alumni and what they're doing. Um, and I've also talked to a number of students from San Jose State who ended up going to schools not near San Jose State. And they didn't necessarily have the best of experiences um, or it was a lot more challenging than they thought it would. So I don't know if the three of you have any feedback or suggestions or comments about how important the surrounding areas, whether it's geography or the culture of the school or the diversity of the school, um, urban versus rural, how much do those types of issues, how much should they play into my decision? I know I've stumped you all. No, no, I think that's a huge question. And um, it, it's, again, one of those, it depends. Uh, I think that um, my particular experience, uh, most of us were from out of the area. And so that provides an opportunity for people to really bond um, because most of us were away from home. Uh, when you have, um, uh, programs that are maybe smaller or um, in more, let's say like the Midwest, for example, you know, you tend to have people that are more likely to be in the area. Um, and so it's harder to, I mean, I found like some of my colleagues um, who did go to different uh, types of master's programs found that um, it, it was more challenging for them um, when they didn't necessarily have a pod or have people, but some of it is, you know, orientation plays a role in finding your people, um, taking classes with other people. I think just being vulnerable and just saying like, this is new for me, this is new for everybody. But I do think, Deanna, you're mentioning, um, you know, diversity is a big issue. I know for me, it was huge to make sure that my master's program and my PhD um, had faculty that were experts in um, race and ethnic studies. Uh, and so, that also helped uh, my retention and helped um, my ability. So it isn't just your um, colleagues or your students, your, your friends, I guess, um, but you're going to graduate school to study something. So make sure that that's also part of your support toolkit. I think this is a very personal decision. I'll just tell you when I asked when I was an undergrad, thinking about where to apply, the advice I got ranged from where it is shouldn't matter at all. You should go to the best program or the program that most closely aligns with your research interests, no matter where it is, um, to um, re you know, responses more like what we just heard, right? If, you, if there are other things that are important to you, uh, I would absolutely look to see if those are in place in the programs that you're seeking out. Um, I moved across the country for grad school and the first semester was a little tough because uh, I knew no one, but then again, everyone else in my PhD program had also moved from somewhere else. So it just, it did take some time and, um, you know, I made some friends and some connections there that I still have to this day of, you know, very close friends as a result of that experience. But yeah, moving away from your social support uh, is tough for everybody, um, but I don't have an, I don't have any, you know, I also have people in my life who, uh, for whatever reason, you know, won't live in rural areas or won't, you know, so that, I think that's pretty individual, but I would say apply broadly, uh, apply to, to several places broadly, right, and then you may or may not have a choice amongst programs, right, in terms of all of these people are doing things I'm interested in, and this also happens to be in a city. Uh, and if I like living in cities, that seems preferable, right? So I would say apply broadly um, to give yourself um, more choice on that. And I am not the, I would not say like only, it only matters in terms of fit or interest, but I would just say there's a range of opinions out there 
uh, in terms of what you should be looking for. But if you have a good understanding and are in touch with your own priorities and values, then I think you should look for those in the program uh, to which you're applying. I agree. I mean, I, I want to really echo what Dr. Burciaga said about um, the importance of, of having and building a community when you're in graduate school and that it's, it's really that social environment, that social support um, that you can build. And oftentimes you'll find, as Dr. Mullen said as well, that um, in a graduate program, if you're moving, um, you're not going to be alone. There's going to be others who have moved from all over the world as well. And, and I'll also add this, um, I, I want to choose my words carefully because I don't know where anyone on this meeting is from, uh, but I can say that anthropology PhDs typically take a heck of a lot longer than just about any other PhDs. Social science in general takes an awful long time and anthropologists were notoriously slow, so it can be as long as 10 years, it took me six. Um, but coursework, you know, if you're in this sort of stuff, coursework, like we mentioned before, some of the professional, the master's degrees are typically two years or two years and change, and um, you've got three to four years in the professional doctorates. Um, and even in the PhD where it took six years, I was only had to be at the university for courses for two years. Um, and, you know, I went to university in Tampa, Florida, and let me tell you that Tampa, Florida is a lovely place to visit, um, but it is my least favorite place that I've ever lived in my life. Um, and so, but I, but I, I, I toughed it out, as it were, um, uh, in, in the company of great folks from all over the world, and that community really, really um, sustained it. And, you know, there was good food and everything. It's a lovely place to visit, not my, my favorite place to live. So you can, you can get through it. You can, you know, um, I wouldn't say disregard it, but you can sometimes muddle if not suffer through a place that is not necessarily your can i just add that that uh if you are staying local there's also really amazing benefits to that if you know your faculty if you know, know other people that are going to be applying um, or going to the program as well uh, but the one thing that i would recommend uh, is i've seen most pro programs that follow a cohort model are more successful with creating that kind of community because students begin together and they end together. Uh, so if you're really, you know, wanting to get that uh, experience of, of having a community kind of built for you, um, there's some really great uh, approaches with the cohort model. It's not always perfect, if, you know, for your family and family sometimes after three days, um, but it's great to be able to struggle with each other and, and, and work with each other that way. I think you raised two questions. Rebecca, just because you said it right there, um, how am I going to know if it's a cohort model? Is that something that the websites say? How do I get the information like that? Usually the websites will say. If not, then that's a great opportunity to email a faculty member, the chair of the department, and just say, do you follow a cohort model? It's a very common question. Um, there was another question about applying broadly, and I think that's a, how many schools should I actually apply to? Um, there's a cost involved with applying, so I don't know if I can afford to apply to 10 different schools, um, yet is three enough? What's the recommendation there? I would say talk to someone in your discipline uh, to know the answer to that. To me, 10 does not, like for a PhD program in the social sciences, 10 does not sound like a lot. Um, and three, I would be nervous for the student. Um, so, but I, I think like I can even see AJ's face, right? Like, so maybe that's true in psychology and, and somewhere else three would be plenty. I would say don't apply to a program that you would never go to right? Um, that's a waste of their time and also um, it's probably costing you some money. But um, yeah, I would say apply broadly because also sometimes when programs are thinking about admitting students, uh, a particular faculty member may already have three or four students and they might think that you're wonderful but just cannot take another student that year. So I just feel like there's a lot of things that are outside of your control uh, in terms of who's taking a student, how many they're going to take that particular year. Um, and you may, if you've interviewed faculty in advance, you may have information about that. But if you don't, right, 
um, you may you may not have a shot somewhere that ha and it has nothing to do with you or your skills or abilities. And so um, I and again for PhD programs, ten doesn't sound like that much to me. For a master's program, um, you know that certainly seems sufficient. But we I usually tell people like think about your ideal sort of top two. I would be thrilled if I got into these schools, and then also another level of schools that I would still be happy to go. Right, and, and that's what I mean by broadly, but never to apply to like, I do not, like, I have no interest in this program. I just want a master's degree. That doesn't make uh, sense. I apologize if I made a face. I, I had, <laughs> um, I, I had a, 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 a master's student who graduated a few years ago and I found my, myself writing 12 different letters of recommendation all in the course of two weeks. And my head is still spinning from that. I think that was 2018. Um, and I read an awful lot of these letters of recommendation, but um, I, I don't know. I, I, I'm gonna actually defer to Dr. Mullen on that because um, I, I do like the idea of having those two tiers and really eliminating places that you would not take seriously. Um, uh, I only applied to two myself um, with the, the PhD program. What happened? Is I talking? Do you want me muted or unmuted? Continue to talk. I think I let someone in and it bumped the button. Sorry about that. Oh, that's okay. Um, I, I'm not sure where I got muted there. But at any rate, yeah. I, get 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 the guidance from uh, from folks in your discipline and in the discipline that you're interested in. Um, and, and that's all I have to add. I did think 10 was a lot, but um, but that's that's going to vary by discipline for sure. Dr. Bersiaga is putting great tips in the chat room. Um, and actually, she brought up one of the questions that I was going to ask. What about cost? Does that matter? How much of a factor should that be? Um, you know, do different schools offer different opportunities to allow me to even work on campus. Anybody want to talk about that? That's a hard question. Um, it's another one, it depends. I knew that when I went to my master's program, there wouldn't be any opportunities uh, to, I mean, I took out a loan. <laughs> uh, um, but the opportunities to do research and to get paid for it were largely with the doctoral students. So the master's students don't get opportunities to do that work at that at, at the Harvard School of Ed, but that's not the case in other institutions. So uh, I think it's worth, um, again, connecting with the alumni. I think that was a great uh, uh, suggestion. Um, reaching out to some of the faculty even before you apply uh, would be okay. If they don't have time, you can say, you know, or can you connect me with a graduate student or the admissions office? There's lots of different ways that you can ask the question before um, before applying, so that you kind of know, you know, are there are there research opportunities? Are there funding opportunities? Are there scholarships? Um, but I did I I kind of just bit the bullet and just took out a loan for my master's degree, and that's. Uh, I, I think it's true that that it's typically going to be not just PhD programs, um, but master's programs in departments that have PhD programs as well uh, are more likely to have uh, funding that can um, really, you know, result in potentially in tuition waivers and in uh, stipends to to significantly subsidize your your cost of living but that's going to be in what what uh we call research one institutions um where they they have multiple phd programs and some of that uh the particulars of how it works are are, are not worth getting into today but let's just say some of that trickles down there, there's more more research funding and and it's more available to masters uh and even some professional doctorate students um in those programs 
interests. So it's more likely in the PhD intensive um, institutions uh, where you'll get funding, but um, just like Dr. Borsia, like I was saying, the, um, at San Jose State, we have a number of different scholarships, awards, uh, research assistantships that have stipends, um, but it's not necessarily going to pay the rent, but it, it's, it's not nothing. Um, so there's a combination of these resources that you can cobble together, um, but it's not going to be typically like an R1 institution where you have that, you know, sort of full ride or an 85, 90% ride. Um, you're less likely when you're going into a program that is just a master's program or just a professional doctorate program. Okay, I'm watching the time. I do want to ask a quick question um, about GRE, MCAT. I had a student the other day ask me, do I have to take that? When should I take it? Um, does that vary by school? Will that maybe determine, you know, how to apply or where to apply? It does vary. Consult the program you're interested in. Um, some require GREs. Um, uh, I mean, you're not going to get into law school without an LSAT. I mean, some disciplines you're absolutely going to, you have to take the standardized test to get in or the MCAT if you're going medical. Um, but GRE, for instance, we don't require the GRE in our program. Um, uh, is more likely in a PhD program, but there are some master's programs that do require uh, uh, the GRE is good to, it's, that's usually in, that information is usually in, you don't even have to make a phone call about that. It's usually in like the FAQ portion of a website of the pro program you're looking at. Um, yeah. And I, I want to just uh, be very upfront and say that I did terribly on my GREs. So bad. Uh, and what is really, really important is that you write a really strong statement of purpose that reflects who you are as a student student, the kind of work that you want to do. Um, and even without, with doing terribly on my GRE, I ended up getting a, um, a Spencer fellowship that funded three years of my PhD program. So the GRE is not the deciding factor in some situations. Uh, so if it's required, you know, take it, uh, if that's where you really want to go, um, but don't lose too much sleep over it. I could add to that too. And I often joke that I became an anthropologist because I wasn't particularly good at math. Um, and um, it, there's maybe some truth to that. But when I went to take the GRE, uh, I, I went to a tutor for about eight weeks before I did it. Um, and, uh, you know, fortunately, there was like a, you know, a local sort of tutoring business where I was. And, uh, um, that really, really helped me. I was able to perform uh, uh, on the GRE far, far better than I, I, I could have without it. So tutor, study guides, all those different things, if you are going to take it. And then, yes, like Dr. Bursiaga said, it, it's not necessarily going to make or break you if your other materials are compelling. I don't have much to add beyond um, I waited until the last minute to take mine and then had to take the scores I got. So some students will um, procrastinate less than me and take it earlier. And then if you really wanted to, you could take it again. And sometimes schools will, you submit your best score. So if you're concerned about it, right, you could build in a couple extra months um, to take it early. And finally, the pandemic has sort of thrown a wrench in this whole thing as well, in terms of some schools waiving, some schools that often require are waiving or not. So um, yeah, just look into the program you're interested in. Thank you. Um, I'm gonna ask this question and then hopefully just, does it matter if I stay at the same school where I received my undergraduate degree or should I go to three different schools? Is it okay if I stay at one? Thoughts on that? I think it depends on, on what you want to do. I think, um, you know, if I think about uh, the field of education, you know, you could get, get your, you know, undergraduate degree, your teaching credential, your administrative credential, 
and your EDD all at San Jose State and, you know, be amazing in, in Silicon Valley and Santa Clara County, but it, it really depends on what you want to do. If you, um, you know, are looking to uh, be a professor, for example, part of our, you know, the, the catch is that we should move around. We should be a little bit mobile in training so that we get these multiple touch points and multiple, um, yeah, approaches to mentorship. I usually err on the side of encouraging people to go elsewhere if they have the like freedom in their life to do that. Some people have family, right? They don't want to leave the Bay Area, et cetera, right? But um, I think there's value to learning from people you haven't already learned from. Um, that being said, I guess if somebody was, like if you felt like your perfect fit in terms of research interest was already at the place where you were, I would not tell you to go somewhere else just for the sake of going somewhere else. But yeah, I think it's up to um, life constraints and, um, but all things being equal, maybe going somewhere else, I, you know, marginally on that side of the equation. Great, thank you. I hope you all saw Dr. Bursiaga's final words of wisdom maybe there, maybe not because we can ask more questions, but in the chat, take a look at what she said about making this process fun and figuring it out. Any other final words of wisdom or should we jump into the questions? Questions are good. All right. So you've heard a lot of talking. Why don't you go ahead and raise your hands or type in questions in the chat and the panelists will answer those questions. We have about eight more minutes left of today's session. Is it okay to unmute? Yes, that's wonderful. Thank you, Lex. Of course. Hi, I'm Lex. Um, thank you guys for putting on this presentation, by the way. Um, I have one question just because um, I am not the best at math and so the GRE does scare me, but I did like how um, someone mentioned a strong personal statement. I was just wondering how can we prepare um, for this strong personal statement because I'm hoping that will get me by. <laughs> uh, so the way that I approached it was starting early. So um, a couple months before you're thinking about, about applying and you send it to as many people as will read it to give you feedback. Um, I think that it's also fair to ask other graduate students for a sample of their um, state, uh, personal statement. I think it's also a great opportunity maybe for um, another session just focused on personal statement development. Uh, I'm happy to share mine uh, with you, uh, knowing that, you know, everybody's personal statement will differ. So those are some of the approaches I used. I loved all of those tips. And also, um, you know, if you have experience related to, again, tying back to that research experience or internship or whatever, right? Having those experiences is also gonna bolster your personal statement. It gives you something to talk about um, in that statement. And, and I also tailored mine to the places I was applying. I was broadly interested in social psychology, but at different places, people were doing slightly different things. And I tailored my statement a bit to express interest in those topics. And I'll add also, I, I've got really nothing to add to what's already been said about the personal statement, but you know, there's also another component of the application too, which is uh, oftentimes uh, there are programs, and this varies significantly by disciplines, but oftentimes they want a sample of work, right? For instance, in my program, we want a writing sample that's at least eight pages or longer. Um, and so that's another opportunity um, to demonstrate your skills. And it's, um, I find just about anything easier to write than a, than a, a personal statement or, or or a cover letter. I feel like that is like one of the most sort of um, groan inducing genres of writing. Um, I really wish we could hire someone to do it for us and just be like, 
he's the best, you know, because it's really, it's really challenging to do that and represent yourself well. Um, so the writing sample is a great opportunity to do that too. And just like Dr. Borciaga said, get feedback from as many people as possible. Even if this was your most best paper, let's say that you wrote in your senior or junior year, if you're anyone like me, you'll look at anything you wrote as much as six months ago and cringe like you're finding poetry you wrote as a teenager. <laughs> Uh, and so um, you don't have to submit a fossil, right? You can go back to your best paper and actually tweak it and revise it before submitting it as a sample of work. Okay, cool. Thank you guys so much. Appreciate it. All right, Sean has his hand raised and I'm also putting messages in about getting some of the other questions answered. But Sean, go ahead and unmute yourself and ask your question. Yeah, I just have a quick question. I'm not sure if it could be answered quickly or not, but um, it's like uh, sometimes when you study a degree path, uh, I notice a lot of students or some people would just say, oh man, I studied the wrong thing, but you know, it's the, it's the degree that counts. I have a bachelor's, I can get basically, you know, it, I can get any job, you know, you hear people land in different jobs with different degrees. Um, so is the master's or like anything beyond the bachelor's is that different you know like is that still does that still apply do i still you know having that degree can that still get me like any job if i made a mistake you know because i want to make the right choice i don't want to make the wrong decision because i think you can afford that you know mistake or you know not mistake but you know your journey per se you know if you go your bachelor's and then you land in somewhere else and you're like, oh man, I wanted to try this out, but you know, if you know what I'm saying. I do know what you're saying. And I think, you know, I'm, I frequently shock students by trying to impress upon them, like how little your undergraduate major actually matters at the end of the day. Um, and sometimes students find that unsettling, especially when they're like juniors or seniors, and they're just hearing that for the first time. Um, but um, uh, so yeah, there's a remarkable amount of plasticity with a with a bachelor's degree, right? You find that regardless of your disciplines, with a few exceptions, uh, like if you have a teaching certificate or you're in nursing, with a few exceptions, um, you're generally competing for a lot of the same jobs and for and in a lot of the same places. Um, and there is, I think, at a graduate level, certainly at a PhD level, um, uh, there is a narrow thing, right? Um, in terms of the types of um, careers and jobs that you're going to be most compelling for, but it's remarkably full of surprises. Um, and I meet anthropologists in in the sometimes the most unlikely of places, um, like including the immigration officer that was processing, you know, my wife's uh, green card at one point, you know. Um, and so uh, there is some plasticity, and and you can. And you can find that out when you're looking at a, a, at a master's program, again, by looking at those alumni and seeing, are they all in very specific and very similar jobs or is there a diversity here? Is there an opportunity for you to craft and, and choose your own adventure as you go? I'm gonna jump in super quick because I know Dr. Bursiaga does need to leave so we can say bye, thank you very much. Um, it is five o'clock. I put in the link for an evaluation, which I'll, Put that in the chat one more time here. Um, if you want, go ahead and fill that evaluation out. But the important piece of this is if you put your name and email and you want me to follow up and you have more questions, that way you can get connected and I can answer some of those questions or even connect you with the three panelists or even other people at San Jose State. So please go ahead and fill that out. Um, we also have other sessions, which I put in letters of recommendation, writing those statements of purpose that were talked about, how to even apply, how to get different funding. So there's other sessions coming up. So look to that flyer and get the links. Um, and then we will stick around. If you do have a few questions, I'll be here. I don't know if Dr. Foss and Dr. Mullen can stick around just for a few minutes for those last minute questions, but thank you everyone. As people are signing off, just go ahead and unmute yourself and ask questions. So there's a question, does your master's have to be closely related to undergrad? Would you like to fill that one out? 
I don't think so. You have to have a story in terms of why you're interested in that masters, but you, yeah, just, well, that's following up on what Dr. Foss said earlier, right? Like, yeah, you just need a compelling reason for why you're interested in that masters. And, you know, the, sometimes there's a little work you have to do to, to go that route, right? Um, so, for instance, in, in my graduate program, uh, we have what's called, there's admission and conditional admission. Um, and, you know, so there, we might have an undergraduate student who didn't major in anthropology um, who applies to our program because, you know, it was too late. Maybe they, they you know, they were in a, a major that, you know, essentially their parents chose for them. And then their senior year, they took that cool anthropology course that blew their minds. And, um, and, uh, and so now they're choosing this route and they maybe have one or two courses, but we'll make sure in my program, typically it's three courses. We make sure you have a solid introductory course. You have a solid methodological course and you have a solid, um, theoretical course. Um, and it doesn't pr particularly matter to us where you, you take that. I mean, we'll, we'll evaluate that case by case. Um, so we'll admit students sometimes provisionally and they'll have to complete three or two or one of those three um, before their conditional status is lifted. Um, and that, that determines a little bit like what their coursework progress is like, but we try to keep people really, you know, connected together in their cohort. We never speak openly about it. You know, you don't have to wear a special conditional hat or something that, that sort of singles you out. Um, all students are, are welcomed into the program equally. It's, it's not like a, like a second class status or anything like that. Um, we just want to make sure that we're setting you up to succeed and that you have some of these foundations before you proceed in the program. And, and that's, you'll find that that's going to be true at other programs as well. All right, with that, I think I am going to say thank you, Dr. Foss. Thank you, Dr. Mullen. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you to all the participants that are still here. Um, I hope that you can attend some of the others and I hope you got a lot out of today's session. Bye everyone, thank you.